Hello, and uh, welcome as you join us for this conversation with American historian Mark Knoll about a couple of his books, a couple of his many books, actually, and uh, more generally about his take on the history of the Christian faith and its prospects for, for the future in the modern world. Professor Knoll is a distinguished academic who recently retired as the Francis A. McAnany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame in the States. He's currently Research Professor of History at uh, Regent College in Vancouver, Canada. Mark specializes in American religious history, particularly the history of evangelicalism. And his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, published in 1994, continues to attract a good deal of attention and even make some waves as well, I think. But while he's written on many different subjects and periods of history, and I'm sure the, uh, the USA will, uh, will enter the conversation at, at various points. But today we're going to focus on two of his books that roam beyond its borders. One is What Happened to Christian Canada. This is published by Regent, uh, Regent College in 2007. And the other one is Turning Points. There we are moments, decisive moments in the history of Christianity, first published by Baker Academic in 1997 and now in its third edition. And uh, that, uh, as, as its name suggests, that book covers a, a, the, the whole swathe of, of Christian history, really. If you're watching this live, you're welcome. Uh, you've got a question for Professor Noel. You're welcome to email it to the address you'll see on the screen, uh, questions at regentcollege.edu, and uh, we'll deal, try and we'll deal with those as we go along. But Mark, uh, warm, welcome to you. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm delighted to do so. It's, uh, uh, in this Zoom age, it's a privilege to be 2,000 miles away and in Vancouver at the same time. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'm not in Vancouver either, but uh, we're kind of we're, we're virtually there. Great. Um, so let's begin with this book on on Canada that you wrote. A little book. It's 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 a lot shorter than uh, your big book on um, uh, turning points, but it, it it still packs a punch. Nevertheless, what prompted you to to ask the question? What happened to Christian Canada? I had come to enjoy uh, getting to know a little bit about. Canadian history, the history of Christianity in Canada, through reading, but then also through personal uh, contact. Uh, the historian George Rollick at Queen's University in Kingston became active in the group of sort of evangelical historians that I was, uh, I was participated in. I'd enjoyed having uh, John Stackhouse from Ontario in classes at, at uh, Wheaton College. And then uh, visits to Regent to teach were, were always pleasant because uh, uh, the, the, the bookstore of Bill Reimer had a lot of good Canadian titles and the chance to read the Vancouver Sun and the National Post and the Globe and Mail intensively uh, sparked the, uh, or nourished an interest that had been there, I think, from the beginning. And the interest was, what could be learned about American history of Christianity in comparison to Canadian history of Christianity, which in so many ways was similar, but in some ways strikingly different. So. This uh, question was in the back of my mind for, for quite a while. And then as it happened, I served for a year as the president of the American Society of Church History. And at the end of that year, you have to give a lecture. And I thought, well, this would be a good time to step back and as an amateur Canadian historian to try to, to try to say what can explain the pretty dramatic shift in the history of Christianity in Canada from, say, 1940 to 1970. And just a, a, as a background to... Uh, uh, point out how interesting that question is. Up until the 1960s, pollsters, survey re researchers found regular church attendance in Canada maybe 40 to 50 percent higher than in the United States. By 1980, regular church adherence in Canada had fallen to maybe half or two thirds of what it was in the United States. Why did Canadian provinces, with, with no exceptions, uh, allow for religious education, Christian education in most cases, in the schools with hardly a, a ripple of controversy. While in the United States, the question of 
anything religious in the schools had been a contested issue right from the middle of the 19th century, right into the 21st century. So there are a number of really intriguing questions about these two societies that had so much in common and yet such interesting differences. And so this, this essay really is an attempt to try to uh, answer the question. And I don't think I answered it very well, but it was, it was fun to try. Yeah, I mean, you you said there that um, it, it kind of between 1940 and 1970 that this decline happened. But I mean, it, 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 at points in the book, you you give the impression it's almost even more dramatic than that, particularly in places like like Quebec, where right. uh, one right. priest, you quote, as as saying, you know, it pretty much happened in a matter of weeks in yeah. in his yeah. congregation. Um, you know, the, the the church is just emptied. I mean, what? How do you begin to explain that? Well, re really good uh, historical analysis has been de devoted to that question by Canadians, although not as much as uh, you might might think. Uh, Michael Govro, a really good historian at uh, McMaster in, in Ontario, ha has suggested that for uh, Quebec, what you had is a situation with a lot of building pressure, different groups within the Catholic Church arguing what it meant to be truly Catholic, differences over doctrine, difference over uh, personal religious practice, differences over uh, social outreach in Catholicism, but all was contained so long as there was a political, ecclesiastical, economic alliance of leaders that kept the lid on. But then toward the end of the 1950s, um, the uh, political arrangement uh, changed, the Union Nacional was replaced by the, the Liberal Party, the Second Vatican Council seemed to open up to Catholics the idea of a much freer, much, much more uh, uh, open understanding of the faith itself. Attitudes toward the family shifted. Uh, Quebec was famous, notorious, and some of having large families. Well, the ideas of, of married life, of sexu sexuality began to change, not because of secular influences, but because of currents within the, in the Catholic Church. And then these things uh, uh, coming together the late 50s and early 60s did, did lead, as I think you're quoting uh, a line I found in a, a, a movie from the mid 60s. It was as if on October 16th, 1961, the church is just suddenly emptied out. The story for Protestants in Canada is not quite as dramatic because it, it, you don't have the just the dramatic uh, events of the 1960s where, where the, the Catholic churches do empty out, but um, it is still pretty dramatic. Uh, the histories of Protestant churches uh, outside of Quebec are, are histories of, of uh, bringing together uh, a, a variety of, of Protestant uh, elements. There never was a strong fundamentalist modernist controversy in Canada, the very echoes of, of just a little bit, but not much. So right into the 1960s, more evangelical uh, groups focused on personal salvation, more social concern groups for, focused on reformer society, worked together, cooperated. Um, the churches were, were major forces in institutional, social, cultural life. A big change anticipating what happened in, in uh, all of Canada was the, the beginning in World War II era, where the governments, provincial and federal, began to take over some of the social welfare work that the churches had, had, had done. That's in the background. And then the same kind of, of top-down collapse that you saw in Quebec immediately, I think, began to take place in, in the Canadian churches as well. One of the big differences between Canadian and American religious life is that Canadians remembered to respect their betters. Americans since 1776 have just forgotten all about that, that way of handling things. That's, over, that's overstated. But I think a Canadian society had been traditionally somewhat more hierarchical, somewhat more willing to follow the major leaders and the major leaders right into the post-war era had been Christian to one degree or another, sometimes heartfelt and practicing, sometimes nominal and conventional, but, but publicly Christian. That changes in the 1960s, and you can find a pretty dramatic shift almost immediately thereafter, filtering down through uh, Canadian society. The, the United um, Church... Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Ewan. You, you no, no. Um, we'll we, we come back to these, you know, the kind of church factors in a moment, but I mean, the consequences of this haven't just been, you suggest, I think, uh, haven't just been a kind of um, what one might say is, a, you know, couldn't care less attitude towards religion. You, I mean, you quote somebody as saying Christianity's not only been 
disestablished, but banished. That suggests a certain kind of hostility and um, a kind of um, refusal to allow a public presence to the churches at all. I mean, that is, that's a massive swing, isn't it? It is, it is and, and I think um, it may have something to do with what has been called the pendulum effect. So you have a, a, a Canadian public life that into the 1950s just takes Christian faith for granted. There's the beginning of space for Jews, not really so much for Muslims and, and, and non-Abrahamic uh, faith, but they just, they, they just accept it, that Christianity is the unofficial culture of, of the land. But then the pendulum, once it begins to swing, swings far to the other side. And uh, a symbol of this is in the mid-60s, early 70s, Pierre Elliott Trudeau wants to talk about multiculturalism as, as the goal of Canadian society. Well, from some Christian angles, there's nothing wrong with that at all, unless the multiculturalism becomes an ideology in itself that does not allow the public expression of, of individual uh, matters of faith. So again, Quebec is a kind of extreme example, but there have been the, the uh, disputes really for what, five or six years. Can people in public or people who uh, work for Quebec have religious symbols? Well, it's obvious that the legislation is aimed at militant Islam, but it ends up undercutting with a very traditional Catholic way of having a crucifix in a classroom or wearing a cross. And, and so the, 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 the move had, was from what had been almost uniform on one side to almost the opposite kind of uniformity on the other side. The United States is different. Everything that has showed up in Canada showed up in the United States, but scattered. So, so there'll be pockets of, of very strong anti-religious secularism in the United States, but also pockets of very strong Christian culture where uh, some people would even say, well, even if Christianity is, isn't true, I'm going to still be a Presbyterian. I'm going to still be a Methodist. I'm going to still insist that we don't sell liquor on Sunday. You know, so the, 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 the cultural diversity, the, the, the pluralism of the states, is, has been greater than in Canada. And again, Americans just have never thought it was important to follow the, the leadership of those on high. So if someone says, you do this, they'll be part of the society in America that follows, but they'll be part of the society in America that says, so who are you to tell me what to do? And that, that difference, which is subtle and certainly doesn't explain everything, is I think one of the major national differences across the, 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 the border. Yeah, so I mean, in this, this question that you ask, you know, what, what happened to Christian Canada? I mean, obviously, there's the assumption that there was a kind of time when it was Christian in some sense. What do you mean by that? Um, well, what, what is Christian in that in that sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a that's a it's a very good question. Uh, historically considered, you look at things that can be researched. Uh, um, the, the the use of religious materials in in, in public schools the deference of the lieutenant uh, generals to uh, prayer, uh, to e evocations of God. Now, do those matters equal heartfelt participant, uh, we would say genuine personal Christianity? Sometimes yes, some, sometimes no. Um, the, the, the striking thing about the end of Christian Canada in my or one of the striking things about the end of Christian Canada in my mind is that it has actually offered an opportunity for the Christian faith to be embraced, not for the sake of anything cultural or social, but because people want to adhere to the Christian faith. Church attendance in Quebec is the lowest in the North America, but the Catholics and increasing number of Protestants who go to church in Quebec are, are there because they want to go to church. They're, they're not there because they think it, it, it's, it's meaningful for the society. Evangelical groups in Canada had been uh, a, a marginal presence on the sideline to the, to the more established churches, but from the 50s and 60s, institutions like Regent College, uh, InterVarsity in, in Canada, the, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada have carved out space, not claiming to rule the society, but to ask what may active, seriously engaged Christian people do in the public square, not demanding authority, 
but demanding or asking for a place uh, of influence. So in some ways, the end of a, a formally official Christian Canada has, in my mind, meant the opportunity for more specifically organizational, personal varieties of integral Christianity to come to the surface. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, even in this, what happened to Christian Canada at the moment, there'd be a lot of secular people um, who, uh, or maybe even some of you are quite sympathetic to to religion in, 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 in some ways, but who would say, well, you know, good riddance, you know, because right. your 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 um your book makes it, it alludes to this. It's written in two thousand and seven, um, right. but you know since then we've seen a lot more fuss about the uh, the, the the Indian reservation schools right. um, uh, and um, residential schools. Sorry, and the 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 way in which the churches were implicated in what right. was a kind of program of cultural genocide really and and then recently we had this awful uh news about uh, graves being discovered right. Of, right. of children and so on a, a lot of people would say good riddance to christian canada if that's what it was all about right exactly and, and the um the, the the record of the residential schools is in fact a really interesting what should we say litmus test for for uh, assessing cultural values in the Canadian situation, on, on one hand, you can say the abuses that are now coming manifestly to the surface, this terrible record of, of physical, sexual, educational, cultural abuse shows the, the sordid underbelly of official Christianity. I'm looking at Canadian reactions to the residential schools and the recent revelations, however, from the United States. And what's the difference? The United States has never fully embraced the tragedy of native genocide that was carried out in the part of North America that became the United States from the 1620s to the 1990s. Mm. So, so I'm, I'm looking at the United States and I, I see modern secular Canada asking the type of deep moral questions about residential school that simply are second level or third level concern in the United States. And I'm asking you, why is that? Mm. One answer is that the depth of instinctive Christian morality was at, was, was at such a place in Canadian society that even when the Christian theology leaves, the moral consciousness is, is still there. In the United States, a much higher percentage of people go to church. And actually, as in, in Canada, there really are some uh, 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 flourishing Christian communities in the, in the first native parts of, of, of the country. <clears throat> but the, the, the issue of displacing, killing, taking the land of the natives energizes only a small fraction of the American populace, m much less proportionally th th than in Canada. Now, why is that? Well. One of the reasons is, back to the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Does, mm. does, it, does it mean to be Christian in a country where everybody goes to church? Or, does it, or might it mean where there's a moral consciousness about how people are treated when they're on the margins of society? And if, if, if that becomes the question, then the, the, then the issue of comparing nation with nation becomes much more complicated, much more interesting, but also much harder to answer in a small book like I, like I tried to write. Yeah, no, no, fascinating and, and really important stuff. And it obviously is, um, you know, it's, it's exercising the consciences of a lot of people at the moment, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, 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 and uh, I mean, I look to the north. And I, I, the first time I was, was in a, a, a setting where somebody began a public meeting by acknowledging the historic land rights of a native people was in chapel at Regent College. Hmm. I've heard that only twice in the United States, both times by Canadian students making a presentation in the United States. Hmm. So hmm. what does it mean to have a Christian consciousness? Well, <laughs> as, as we historians like to say, it's complicated.
Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, that's fascinating stuff. We'll, we'll kind of move on uh, from that point. But um, just to go back to the issue that you identify in the churches, I mean, this this change happened. Um, and for both Protestants and Catholics, you kind of point to theological reasons. You, you've mentioned Vatican II already on the, on the, on the Catholic side, and, and so many of the, the kind of changes that um, were associated with that uh, in, in, in teaching about the family and um, uh, all, all, all sorts of stuff, actually. But the, um, on, a, on the Protestant side, you kind of point to um, the a kind of an embrace of a social gospel and, and a kind of um, uh, certainly a, a sense of obligation to the entire community and interpreting the gospel in those terms. But you seem to be kind of blaming both sides, both Protestant and Catholic, for the situation that then arises. It's their fault. They dug their own grave, did they? Well, uh, yes, uh, and probably uh, when, when you know only a little bit about something, then you can have real strong opinions. If you, if you learn more, <laughs> then, you, then you've got to be you've got to be uh, more nuanced. And I, I, I actually think that the churches did contribute to what might be called the general secularization of society. But again, uh, the, um, the imp one important historical point is they, they contributed because. To, to the secularization because earlier on they contributed so much to the Christianization in both Canada and the United States and in different ways. Uh, the, the shaping of a positive culture with, with, of course, great problems, but also great accomplishments. That shaping was due in substantial part to the contributions of, of, of Christian uh, people. So when uh, you, you have the, the great changes that take place, if, if the churches are integrated into the society, they're of course going to be part of the cause and effect uh, 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 relationship. My sense of differences between Canada and the United States is that the Canadians had a larger place for what could be called liberal evangelicalism or, or evangelical liberalism, a, a, a vision amongst Protestants, and there was a corresponding uh, 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 position amongst Catholics, but a vision among Protestants primarily that would keep together quite a bit of traditional evangelical faith focused on personal redemption, but also a strong social consciousness. And that, that uh, union or that uh, stance lasted strongly into the 50s and 60s. Theologically, the liberal part became more and more liberal the evangelical part became more and more isolated. And actually in Canadian history, I, I think it's the groups like the Evangelical Fellowship in Canada that really pick up some of the task of what might be called liberal evangelical, evangelical liberal, not, not necessarily speaking theologically, but, but speaking about the desire to keep together a traditional supernaturalist view of the Bible, the need for redemption, and a custodial view of the good of society related to the, the, to the Christian faith. In the United States, by contrast, you had in the early part of the 20th century, the beginnings of a fairly sharp divide between those who wanted to emphasize the truth of scripture, the supernatural reality of the faith, and those who wanted to emphasize social well-being and, and, and cultural stability. There was more overlap than historiography sometimes uh, suggests, but that was, that was a divide that was taking place in the U.S. in the teens and the 20s that didn't really happen in Canada really ever, and certainly not until the, the 50s and 60s. So were the churches complicit in the loss of Christian influence in society? Definitely. Should this be a matter simply of blaming the churches for something that's happened? I don't, I don't think so, because much that was good coming out of earlier patterns of life in the two societies was a contribution of the churches. And it's not as though the churches are able to just jump in and jump out uh, as the train is moving along, because they're, they're on board or they're not on board. And, and uh, the churches that weren't on board were not hurt as much by secularization, but they continued to have a marginal place in influencing uh, society. Mm. Great stuff. Well, th th thank you. Um, thank you for the, this, uh, this really interesting in insight into the uh, uh, the, the, the questions facing Canada. Um, we're going to move on to talk uh, more broadly now about 
turning points. But um, uh, I, I was going to ask you a question about how you approach. I mean, clearly we're dealing with very recent, relatively recent right. uh, events um, in, in in this book, um, um, and you know, much of history. It's it's you know, it's uh, we're at a further removal. But there's always a level of interpretation involved. Oh, We've got definitely. a question for, here from. Um, John Doyle, and uh, he asks, what would you say to Christian sympathetic somewhat with a Marxist economic analysis who argue that many of the problems you're discussing can be attributed to the malignant effect of market forces on churches and believers? That's certainly an e excellent question. Um, a, a recent big book from Harvard University Press by Eugene McGarra here would have a simple answer, and the simple answer is, well, that that uh, uh, commitment by Christians to a market system has been the answer for, for all the things that have gone wrong. I don't go that far, but I, I think there's, there's something to be said for the, uh, for the way in which um, Christian commitment to, this, to the economic conventional wisdom without criticism has led to problems. So um, in the United States, if you're sick, you better have health insurance or you're going to be in real trouble. Well, well why, why would people in the United States be opposed to some kind of universal scheme of health insurance like all of the other countries in, in the West? Because um, in the 1930s and 40s, and then later when some kind of universal scheme was promoted, it was called socialist and therefore thought to undercut the commitment to sound economic practice. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a bogus argument, but the commitment to an ideal of individual striving leading to individual reward in many times went, went too far. My own um, uh, reluctance to, 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 to uh, uh, sign on to a Marxist interpretation in general is I, I do believe there is, there is a place for personal responsibility. There's a, there's a place for uh, Christian critique of the economy. There's a, there's a place for Christian critique of large scale governmental uh, uh, agencies, but there's also should have been in both Canadian and US history, a stronger self-awareness of how much the churches were invested in the market, the, the uh, market thinking, the approach to uh, Christian faith that in America, I think more than in, in uh, Canada, signified success if you had a lot of numbers, signified success if you were able to raise a lot of money, signified success if you, if you could get your leaders to talking to the governors and the president. Well, all of these things might not be horribly wrong, but they do show the influence of a mindset in which market reasoning uh, pertain. So in the same way that almost all of the historical fashions of the recent past, I think have contributed. So feminism contributes to Christian historians taking a closer look at the contribution of women. The, 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 the emphasis we've had in the last 20 and 25 years on civil rights um, should have the Christian people thinking more in terms of what, what, what does that element add to in the interpretation of the past. So also those that make the very strong case that the struggle for the control of the means of production determines all of history should be listened to, not as providing the answer, but it's contributing to an answer, contributing something important to understanding the complexity of the past. And the past is every bit as complex, complex as the present. Hmm. So that's actually a good question. That's an inadequate answer for, for a really good question. Thank you. And um, you, you've, uh, you know, you're obviously very clear about where you're coming from. Um, I mean, all history is done from a point of view. We've, you know, we, we're more and more aware of this, aren't we? There's no such right. thing as a value-free assessment of, right. you know, we all come with from somewhere with a, a set of of assumptions and and and, and perspectives, um, and there are different schools of history, aren't there? So there are yep. Marxist schools. Yep. Uh, been tremendously, um, uh, tremendously influential in the in universities in in many different parts of the world. Um, 
But you, you, you're very clear about where you're coming from as a Protestant, even an American Protestant evangelical. Right. So how do you, how have you gone about thinking about history as a, as a historian, um, <laughs> trying, you know, trying to right. be, you know, trying to be f clearly faithful to your, your commitments to your faith, to you know, your, your faith in Christ, but also to right. be fed. I mean, how, how, how have you, how do you deal with that? Because I mean, a lot of people say to you, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? You know, writing about right. religion, right? You know, of course, you know, you're, you're just, you know, that's what we'd expect. Now, my, my sense is that uh, in, within the Christian world, there, there has been and there still is room for s several different ways of approaching the past. My understanding of my historian's vocation would be a relatively modern one. And it, it would come from the standpoint of someone who believes that evidence about people, circumstance, events in the past is relatively open. It's never complete, it's rel relatively open. So my sense of my calling as a historian is to use information, uh, evidence that's accessible to everyone to answer questions that I think are important. Now, the framing of questions is, is one place where standpoint obviously become, uh, becomes uh, very important. So in the book, uh, Turning Points that you mentioned, I have two or three of the, I identify as 13 or 14 major turning points in the whole history of Christianity. And several of those have to do with doctrine. Several of those have to do with what I consider to be uh, the important statements of true Christianity. Now, that question is clearly a, uh, a question of interpretation. In dealing with the answers, however, I think is where uh, history regarded as an open search for evidence, the open, uh, uh, the open writing of narratives and the basis of evidence comes into its own. So one of the turning points I, I have in the book is the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 in association with the Empress, Emperor Constantine. Now, is this really one of the most important events in the entire history of world Christianity? Well, that's a debatable question. Uh, and it's actually, it can be a, a debate with a lot of good uh, outcomes if people say why they think it is an important or not an important event. Okay, that's, that's one issue. The other issue is that, well, you're going to look at Constantine, you're going to look at the Council of Nicaea, what are you going to say about it? And that's where I think openness to evidence and open uh, efforts to write narrative come, come into play, because I don't think that he, a Christian historian has the mind of God in the way that Bible writers were inspired. Christian historians, like Muslim historians, like historians, if they came from the planet Mars, have to deal with the evidence. So yes, I'm trying to answer the question, why was the Council of Nicaea, Emperor Constantine so important? But I have to use the same kind of evidence that anybody could use. And I have to construct a narrative where someone could say, granted you think this is important, but you misunderstood what Eusebius recorded about Constantine in this document in this place. In other words, there's an openness to research there's an openness to challenging the way in which research is used to construct the narrative that does, in a sense, it is in a sense subjective, but there's a great deal of objectivity that anyone can participate in. Other varieties of writing Christian history will say, I know what God intended, and I'm showing you through evidence what God intended. I, I actually, I'm very reluctant to make those, those kind of statements. Um, at Regent, uh, I was privileged to do a course on the, the Reformation once mm. and, and really enjoyed talking to students about what they thought was happening in the big scope of things. And I would say, well, as a, a Protestant, there was certainly a lot of good things that happened, but then I can see as a Protestant, a lot of bad things would happen. Do I know, do I wanna say that I have a God's eye view? Well, no, I don't. I wanna say, here's my question, here's the evidence, Give me my question. Recognize that the question is subjective, but here's my objective evidence, and I want you to see if I've used my evidence correctly, if I've dug around to get enough evidence, if I put my evidence together in, in a way that's convincing to answer my questions. And I'll do the same for you. 
you have your questions and I, I need to evaluate them in some sense, whether that's a good question, whether your answer is a good answer. But as a historian, my sense is that mostly I want, I want to concentrate on the, the discovery of evidence, the evaluation of evidence, and the knitting together of evidence in, into a, a, a narrative. Most of my questions will have to do with the Christian faith. Well, because that's, I'm interested in the Christian faith. That's the kind of subjectivity that is inevitable. Uh, but it's not a kind of subjectivity that makes every statement about the past relative simply to what the historian thinks is, is important or the values of the historian. One of the things that your book does, and it does this in all of the chapters, really, not just in the ones that are more about the, the kind of more recent past, um, you know, you're always going backwards and forwards between past and present um, in a, a really interesting way. But clearly, your discipline of history has been influenced by people, deeply influenced by people who've been major critics of Christianity, major right. critics of the way that history was written by Christians in, right. in the past, um, including pr probably some, um, certainly plenty of secularists, and, and right. some Marxists as well. How do you um, how do you approach this question of God's action in history? Then, um, you know, uh -huh. where, where does God show up? Uh, you know, and and when it, when is it appropriate to speak of of uh, of the kind of work of God within a particular historical moment? Right, right. I mean, that's that's the great kind of question always comes up in a, a place like Regent College or Wheaton College, I often came up at the University of Notre Dame. Not so much if you're, you're teaching at the University of Illinois and University of British Columbia. Those are the kind of questions that Christian people, I think, can talk about amongst themselves. I, I've certainly enjoyed my time teaching at Wheaton because there were all, all sorts of varieties of Protestants who would look at it, let, uh, an event like the conversion of Constantine. Was this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, to the Anabaptists, it was the, it was the worst thing that ever happened to Christian faith. For people interested in church music, church architecture, uh, Christian theories of government, it was, it was a pretty good thing. It was the same uh, teaching at Notre Dame. It, it was really fun to, to look at an issue like, or a personality like Martin Luther, a personality like Ignatius Loyola and say, how do you evaluate this person? Um, Sophisticated discussion would say, well, but it would posit first, what kind of question are you asking? Um, and thankfully, in the post Vatican II era, there would be Catholics who would say, well, the evidence points to certain actions by Martin Luther that were desperately needed by the church. The evidence, however, points to certain actions that look like it undermined the capacity of the church. So, in, in the Catholic sense, the Catholic position was driving the question, but in the modern world, it was possible to have, to, to some level and to some degree, objective discussion. Now, the mind of God. Christian people should, I think, always believe in providence. My own sense is that Christian people should always be skeptical about their own ability to understand God's providence thoroughly. Uh, this, this, uh, this belief is pretty deeply ingrained because of studying American history when there have been so many disputes among believers in which one side was convinced that God was moving one way and the other side was convinced to just the opposite. So I'm looking at a, 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 a circumstance early on. I'm looking later and say, well, looks to me like both are wrong. Why, why are people so invested and what they think God is doing. Because I think, at least in part, they're forgetting that human knowledge can never have the kind of certainty about providence that Christians should believe in the certainty. Of, in other words, believing your, your capacity to understand God's way is a very different thing than believing in the capacity of God to rule over the world. And I think proper humility opens a Christian believer to say, well, maybe a Christian believer who sees things differently might have something to teach me. Maybe a non-believer who's looking at similar evidence will also have something to teach me, even though the non-believer might not think, won't think, that God is doing such and such as, as I might. So 
what is God doing in history seems to me a theological question. How to explain evidence, evaluate evidence, knit together evidence. That's the kind of question, I don't, I hate to use the word scientific, but it's, it's a more objective enterprise that should be able to enlist people from very different points of view to cooperate in evaluating evidence and, and uh, critiquing how evidence is put together. Mm, mm. Yeah, this is an inadequate answer to a re really nice, nice uh, question, but but it's it's a perennial one, and, and uh, for believers especially, believers in anything, whether it's a Christian yeah, yeah. faith, Marxism, yeah, to be yeah. put. I, I think it's it's that that sense of well, does history mean anything, or is it just one damn thing after another? You know, that's yeah, the, yeah. Uh, or just just looking back the past through my vision that my goggles that are so skewed in my direction that nobody else can benefit. And I just don't think that that kind of relativism needs to prevail. Yeah, you, the, the the turning points, you've mentioned some of the turning points that you've chosen. You mentioned a couple of councils there, uh, Nicaea and, and Chalcedon, but you've got some, uh, uh, another a couple of interesting ones. I think from, that I, you know, knowing that you are, um, as, as it says, you know, in, in the kind of preamble to the book, this Protestant, evangelical, American Protestant, even, you've picked the rule of St. Benedict and the kind of the monastic right. movement as a key moment you've uh, um as a turning point you've picked um uh well certainly the reformations in there but you've got um the founding of the jesuits in there you know so post reformation uh right some would say counter counter reformation now it's obviously a, another way of, of of understanding it as well you clearly regard these things as very much within the orbit of the same christian story that you I want do. to start for everybody. Why? Well, the, the, the starting of the monastic movement is a, is a good uh, a good example. So I'm a Protestant Christian in the 21st century, and I think Bible study is, is really important. And Bible study should mean, some for some purposes, a, a devotional immersion in uh, what I think the Spirit is telling me. But it also should mean in some, some angles, a really careful study of what the text is, how the text in one part of scripture relates to another. Every time I engage in either a devotional reading of the Bible or a serious scholarly reading of the Bible, I'm following in a tradition that the monks have sustained almost by themselves for almost a thousand years. So I, I really, uh, I think Christian hymnody is, is one of the most important uh, ways that Christian faith is learned, Christian faith is expressed, and Christian faith is shared. Yeah, it's great the way you, you've, uh, you've, you've included a hymn at the beginning of each one of these turning points, and you end well, with a prayer from, the, from, that, from that era as well. It's great. And so, if, if I think that's important, and I, I think, well, you know, I only have Christian hymn today if every generation that's existed since the apostles passes it on. Well, from about the fifth century <laughs> into the 16th century, the Christian hymnody is what is, is sustained by monasticism, almost all by itself. I happen to think that, that uh, one, one group of Christians should be active in seriously studying the world from, you might say, a scientific point of view, from, from Wissenschaft, you know, serious, serious examination of, of scholarship. Well, for a thousand years, all of the Christian scholars in the world are monks. So if, if I think these things are important, I need to look at, with charity at the movement that was more responsible than any other movement for sustaining the Christian capacity to deal with these parts of the faith from every part in Europe and then extending out uh, uh, much beyond. Um, the Jesuits, um, an evangelical Christian, I think it's important to share the gospel. I think it's important. We, we, we have uh, much, much, a great deal more evidence now than 150 years ago. It's important to share the gospel with cultural sensitivity, some kind of self-critical awareness that my cultural understanding of Christian faith is not the only one, some kind of openness to how other cultures are put together to uh, understand how the Christian faith might be directly applicable to them. 
Where does that thinking begin? It does not begin with William Carey in the 1790s. It does not begin with the Moravian missionaries in 1700. It begins with the Jesuits in the 16th century. They're the first European missionaries to go outside of Europe and to say, let's think about what aspects of European Christian, Christianity will help the Japanese, will help the Chinese, and what aspects won't. Jesuit cultural sensitivity has become almost universal Christian cultural sensitivity, but they were there first, they were the pioneers. So if I'm interested in the history of Christianity around the whole world, the Jesuits are just absolute, and, and people like them, are just absolutely important. And they're doing what they're doing in trying to communicate the Christian faith outside of Europe 150 years before Protestants are doing it. So obviously they're important. Now, are they one of the 12 or 13 most important turning points in the history of Christianity? That's a debatable question. Uh, and, and actually, when I've used this book or things similar to this in, in class, I always pose or usually pose as a final question. You take one of the turning points not in this book and you defend it for why you think it's, it's the most important turning point. And that, that's been a good exercise. Yeah. So um, you're very generous, um, you know, certainly in your, your reading of um, lots of uh, uh, lots of, of, of Catholic pre-Reformation thinkers as well um, you've, and, and you kind of um, really explore them and, and want to expound uh, their ideas to and show why, why they're important. And I mean, it's a fact, isn't it, that a lot of um, students who will come from the same evangelical camp as you do, um, uh, when they first discover these folk, uh, maybe through your writings, actually, they discover a whole new world of Christianity, which they find deeply appealing. And actually, what they find missing in their present experience of Christianity. How did, how have you approached that? Because I mean, you must have come across that a lot in the yes. context oh, yes. Where, yes. where you where you've taught, where you've actually basically taught people to become Roman Catholics or Orthodox or right. whatever, you know. Uh, that is an interesting question that we related back to uh, teaching at uh, Notre Dame. So when, when you take a job like that, you get academic questions and how you, how you research and so forth. But nobody uh, told me that one of my jobs is going to be to talk to evangelical students who are just about out the door with evangelical churches on the way to Rome. So over, I don't know, seven or eight times over the decade, I had people come to my office and usually didn't say, you made me do it, but, but uh, they're, they're aware of the fact that uh, I, I've written about real problems in Protestant history, theology, ethics, approach to the life of the mind, uh, music. And, and th these are usually sensitive souls who say, you know, uh, I think the Christian faith should have something to say about the poor. I think the Christian faith should have uh, something to uh, contribute to world peace. And my group, my evangelical group, just no concern for that as well. Well, I, I, I say to these people, examine things carefully, take what, whatever steps you think are necessary to take. But, and this would be the, this would be my trying to retain folks in the Protestant world. I just remember to look globally at where you're going as where as globally from where you have come from. Yes, you will find in the Catholic tradition a deep vein of philosophical reflection that just is very much rarer amongst Protestants. You're also going to find in the Catholic Church a very high level of nominal church adherence. People are Catholics. Well, why are you Catholic? Well, I was born that way. I was baptized. Do you go to church? Well, not very often. Is the, is the faith very important to you? Well, not too often. Um, in, other, in other words, Catholicism is many, many, many things. Protestantism is many, many different things. I would try to save somebody's interest in history. If, if you think there's no Protestant answer, try to read Jonathan Edwards. If you think there's, there's no uh, uh, current theological, try to, this, this would, I would never say, I, I don't remember saying this, I could have said, take a summer school at Regent College and find out from Protestants that the Protestant world is a, is a much broader, deeper, richer world than you have experienced personally. So 
I'm, I'm not an apologist for any, for Protestantism or any one variety. I happen to be a Presbyterian and think there's some good things, some, some bad things. I do believe that God places Christian people where they are for his reasons and that uh, absent some kind of a cataclysmic earthquake, it's, it's appropriate to uh, brighten the corner where you are to try to do the best of what God has given you. And this, this is not going to work out for everyone. But my, my understanding of the Christian faith is that any one expression will, will see some things more clearly than other expressions, but fall short of other expressions as well. So I, I am, in some sense, a Christian relativist, not a relativist. And I think the integrity of Christian life and thought and practice within a Christian tradition is the most important thing. In part because I've learned an awful lot about what the Bible means, uh, what, what the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf means, what, what life in the Holy Spirit means from people who are Pentecostal, Methodist, Orthodox, any variety of Catholic, a lot of my own Presbyterian. Baptist. So the, the, the Christian faith is like a jewel. It's going to sparkle in many different ways. I, I'm a fan of C.S. Lewis and the notion of mere Christianity, which of course has some, some problems. But there, there, is a, there is a center, a heart, an overlapping of the Christian traditions that I think can inspire a wide variety of useful, helpful, and edifying expressions of the Christian faith. As I say, the book is um, uh, is a is a, a, a perspective on the whole of of, of, of um, the, the Christian period, two thousand years of it. But uh, you know, obviously, um, you are commenting on our times as you as you're commenting on 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 kind of previous um, moments in history. And uh, one of them, the the turning points you discuss, um, which you 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 kind of have believe as particular relevance for the West is the French Revolution. Um, you, you don't so much discuss the Enlightenment in that context. Um, it's very much the revolution and what happens as, as a result of that. And there's a, a, a great quote from uh, Arnold Toynbee that you've, you've got in there. Um, the rev in, in the revolution, a sinister ancient religion suddenly re-erupted with elemental violence the fanatical worship of collective human power. And you go on to talk about uh, this um, event as the kind of beginning really of the, the de-Christianization of, of um, certainly of Europe. Um, what, what were you getting at in that, in that quote from Toynbee there that, 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 because I mean, a lot of people yeah. would say, "Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. we got the American Revolution. Yeah, you know, right. this, you know, there's this. Okay, they, they may have had sort of different outcomes and gone through different stuff, but you know, fundamentally, they were fighting for the same notions of human right. rights and so on. Um, why is this a particularly pernicious thing as far as the Christian faith is concerned?" Uh, the, the the true answer I could give you is I forgot, but I I, I like the quotations. So I'll, I'll try and answer. <laughs> But it's been quite a while since I did work on the first edition of the book. I, I think what, it's a long time ago. I think I was what, probably trying to get at that we see with the French Revolution what, um, what extremes a secular rejection of comprehensive Christianity look like. Again, to use the, the image of a pendulum, you have with the Ancien Regime in France a very tight uh, alliance between church and state. You have a very hierarchical sense that the, the, uh, the leaders of church and the leaders of, of state should dictate to the whole society. You have lack of unconcern for the humanity of those who are uh, lowest. And, and the, the, uh, the Catholic part of that might be not the most important part, but the Catholicism is woven into this old way of doing things. The revolution is going to get rid of the old way of doing things. And so part of it is to get rid of uh, Catholicism. But it turns out to have as many or more moral blind spots, as many or more ethical uh, evils as the older system. 
And what I take from that is that the, the secular course of the West, Europe in particular, now North America more and more, the secular course of the West does in fact remedy some of the issues of the old Christendom, but not in the sense of replacing it with something perfect. It's a human construction replacing a human construction. And from a Christian angle, there'll be many things to worry about in the secular construction that replaced the Christendom construction. I think that's what I may have been thinking about. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a great um, sentence um, in, in this context, really, that the critics of Christendom, you say, have in fact been correct to charge that when institutional Christianity dominated Europe, it often led to inhumane disaster. But nothing in Christendom's long, admittedly fallible history could match the depths of degradation to which the 19th century's new deities led. And you're actually talking about the First World yes. War, you know, Europe basically killing its sons, you know, yeah. by the million. Um, and so that you see as a kind of an outworking to you of the, the kind of the philosophical dynamics of the French Revolution? I mean, what, what is it What is it that these new deities, where are these new deities actually coming from? Uh, certainly, uh, there, there's no direct lineage, or, or sim there's no simple lineage, but I, I, do, I do think that when uh, um, the ideas of Nazi collectivism, Soviet collectivism, Maoist collectivism were operational with the slaughter of millions of people, there was in some sense a replication of the French secular rejection of Catholicism, so uh, of the Christendom, not just Catholicism. So the new regime is going to dominate everything for, for people's good. There's that kind of hubris about the uh, ability of a few to speak for the whole that I think is carried over into the totalitarianisms of the 20th century with their, their remarkable uh, record of bloodshed. It's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the First World War clearly has, a, has had a, a, a huge impact. Do you think that the, the kind of, the, the impact of, of something like that, a war, um, are, we tend to look for philosophical reasons why yeah. people lose faith. Yeah. Um, do you think the experience of just because actually to be to be fair here, um, you know, as well, yeah, there were certainly ideologies in the first war. Some of them were imperialistic, and some of them were deeply influenced by the church itself. So the established churches were, and they blessed people and send them off to battle and and and, and all of that. Do you think that experience of warfare and the disillusionment with you know the kind of you know just what authorities can do to the ordinary person. Right. That maybe has as much to do with this whole story of secularization as any philosophical argument. I, uh, uh, yes, uh, and there's been some really thoughtful books. The Philip Jenkins has a very nice book on the churches in World War I, for example. But I, I think one, one of the reasons one can postulate why um, institutional Christianity seems to have survived better in Canada and the United States and much of Europe is that Canada and the United States played secondary roles in the great uh, conflict of World War I, whereas the death and destruction was visited, you know, from, from Moscow to, uh, to London on entire populations. And yes, again, I, I have to take recourse in the historian's nostrum. It's complicated, but uh, what, you have, what you have articulated, I think, is part of the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, you you quote um, Malcolm Arnold's poem, um, you know, right. Dope Beach about the sea of faith and this right. kind of long melancholy withdrawing. And, you know, you say that applies, applies to Europe. It certainly doesn't apply to the, the rest of the world. Um, and, it, you know, it seemed to say and suggest in the book, it didn't really apply to North America as well. But, I mean, in very recently, we've seen yeah. a, quite a sharp decline, haven't we, right. in... Right. Um, Religi religious membership um, right. in the United States. Um, and at the same time, a kind of um, 
a Christian reaction, you know, these culture wars that we, you know, kind of almost wanting to hang on to a, um, a vision of Christian America. Um, what, what, do, you, do you see Europe and North America as having very, very separate kind of trajectories right. or, or is, is, is there a delay as it were? Well, I, I, I think I would sit right differently today than I did when 20 years or so or more. I, I think, yes, they are coming together more. Uh, I do think the, the diversity in what makes the United States different, even from Canada, is just the, the diversity of the population. Uh, the United States is big, unruly, un, un, unregulated and unregulatable. And so I think there, there are pockets of Christendom that survive in the United States. There's not as hegemonic national ideology as in some places in Europe. But, but overall, I, I think that what you have suggested is taking place and that what, what was seen so dramatically in Europe after World War II is beginning to, beginning to take place uh, more dramatically in the United States. The, the politicization of religion has been a, a blow to the integrity of, of religious faith on all sides in, in uh, recent U.S. history. And I mean, it, it, it's become a huge issue in America at the moment, isn't it? You know, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, um, it, it became more obvious in, in uh, Donald Trump's presidency. But, um, you know, it, it almost seems to be a, a rich crisis point now um, to, you know, with, with um, a sense of, you know, the entire legitimacy of major political institutions in the United States being challenged by, um, by Christians, by evangelicals, particularly. Right, right. Well, yes, and, and um, uh, at this point, I've got to, got to do what famously Joe and Lai did when he was asked, well, what about the effects of the French Revolution? He said, too early to tell, too early to tell. So, I mean, actually, the, 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 the issues you raise are, are posing questions that will be answered in one way or another as the years roll by. Whether or not uh, the, the recent five and 10 year history is a blip, whether it's a, a, a premonition of things to come, whether it's a pre premonition in ways that uh, lead to uh, a dr drastic increased loss of church adherence. I think these are simply unanswered, un un unanswerable questions, even though they're really important ones to try to be thinking about. We see these statistics um, regularly quoted about the level of um, evangelical support for, um, uh, for, for Trump particularly um, and the re Republicanism, um, white evangelicals uh, that is. Right. Um, and I mean, you, you obviously you are Mr. Evangelical in terms of history and you, you've got, you're, you know, you're, you're regularly asked to, to unpack these things. I mean, how do you, how do you begin to, help um, folks speak sensibly about right. what, you know, what's going on in terms of the evangelical world and the political world. I don't myself try to do too much interpreting of, of recent events, except to try to say that historically considered, there is a um, meaning for the, the words evangelical and evangelicalism that have primarily to do with personal religious faith, emphasis upon conversion, deference to the Bible, eagerness to share the Christian faith, and emphasis, an emphasis upon Christ's death on the cross is a crucial matter for myself, my community, the world. This, this religiously fairly coherent meaning of evangelical still, um, I believe, has a lot to offer or a lot to explain the whole world where movements, Sub-Saharan Africa, China, parts of Latin America, movements characterized by these religious beliefs and practices are in fact burgeoning. Now, sometimes burgeoning a lot of chaos, but, but they're going. So the, the entanglement of white American evangelicals and the political disputes of the last 15, 20 years, cultural wars, maybe 30 and 40 years, is an important story, but it, it, it may not be the most important story going ahead for, the word's a different thing, but for a kind of Christian faith that trusts in the scriptures, believes it's important to have a personal turning toward Christ, 
believes that the message of the gospel about the death and resurrection of Christ is the key to the human existence, religion characterized by those matters, I think is likely to just continue on, but in different shapes and different configurations and in different cultural alliances around, around the world. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the, the great expansion of, of, of uh, what we would call Pentecostal or charismatic Christianity in the continent of Africa has has very little to do with American culture wars. It's not completely unrelated, but really, really, there's almost an entirely entire set of different dynamics at work. Mm. And and anyone concerned about the religious character of the Christian faith should be as concerned about what's happening in those parts of the world as rightly being concerned about what's happening in North America. Mm. Yeah, and there's plenty um, of stories about that in in your book, right. and um, uh, and in terms of you know kind of future um, stories that need to be told as well. Uh, you 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 kind of spend some time right at the end of the book um, uh, saying that the the story of Christianity under communism, when it can be told fully, will be an extraordinary story, and we're right. we're seeing some of those stories from Soviet Union. China is right. another matter, isn't it? Right. I mean. The, the story of China is, is incredible. But, you know, we go back to where we are at the moment is in right. the West. And yeah. um, we, we seem to be confronted with all sorts of challenges and intellectual challenges. And I think in university context, and certainly with young people who um, are morally concerned, they look at Christian history and they think, Mm, not for me. Um, you know, whether it's the Crusades or, you know, the kind of the wars of religion, uh, whether it's um, kind of slavery and, and, and Christian involvement with these things. I mean, um, as you kind of look over all of this stuff and as you, you, you kind of uh, think of a book like, like Turning Points, I mean, what is it that you really want to to leave people with at the end of the day. I mean, you know, um, that, you know, that, that this is more than just an interesting story. Right, right. I, I, I would, I'm hoping that um, people who attend to the history of Christianity will do so um, with a Christian framework. I, uh, somewhere in the book, I think it might've been the introduction rather than the conclusion, but, uh, uh, in, in my reading of, of the history of Christianity from a Christian angle, the, the, the um, element that sticks out above everything else is divine grace. How is it the church has survived? Well, it has not survived because Christian believers have been morally perfect. It has not survived because Christian believers have done always done the right thing with respect to the environment. It survived because divine grace has sustained, sustained the church. I'm hoping that people can read the history of Christianity and, and find examples of exemplary groups and people who actually are meeting the needs that they see in the present and that the present church might not be attending. So um, contemporary believers in the United States worry about the absence of serious intellectual grappling with questions raised about the existence of God, the goodness of God, and they worry with legitimacy because there's just not a whole lot of energy right now being expended on those matters. But I, I can say as a historian, look, I've, I spent a year or two reading an awful lot of Jonathan Edwards. And if you want, to, you want a mind that's sharper than you are, more devoted to the scriptures than you are, more concerned about God living than you are, and can reason much more deeply about ontological questions, ethical questions, ethical questions, epistemological questions, take some time to read Jonathan Edwards. Now, is Edwards perfect? No, he isn't. But is he dealing at a depth and a breadth with important Christian concerns, as well as anyone in the ideological landscape of the day? And the answer is yes. If you're concerned about, about the, uh, the absence of Christian involvement with the poor, take some time to study John Wesley. Uh, 
take, takes, takes some time to study the women reformers in the 19th century in Britain and America. The women, along with some men, who gave themselves selflessly to the well-being of those who were disadvantaged. Yes, does the contemporary church need to do more? Of course. Is it a situation, however, historically, that the church has never answered the particular need that you think is crucial right now? And the church has on, on almost anything that's imaginable. Not, so I suppose, what to do with artificial intelligence or how to, how to fight the coronavirus. Those, those are contemporary, very contemporary. Every, everything else, a sympathetic, inquiring person can find in the history of Christianity some things to learn positively from. And I, I would hope that um, the, a book like mine, which is introductory and actually it points people toward reading after each chapter is a very important part of the book to say, if you're interested here, if you think it's too simple, there's more to go on, look at some of these books and they'll go much deeper into these problems. That would be my, my hope that, 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 that the, the book would lead to enough substance to realize that uh, quick, easy objections to the Christian faith need more time to be considered. Well, we've been talking about this book, What Happened to Christian Canada, published uh, in 2007 by Regent College, and Turning Points, this massive um, tour through Christian history, decisive mom uh, moments in the history of Christianity both by Mark Knoll. This was published um, originally in 97 and uh, it's got uh, uh, a third edition with new stuff that was um, uh, published a few years back by Baker Academic. And it's been great to talk to you, Mark. Thanks so much for, 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 for giving us the time and um, all the best with uh, whatever projects you're working on at the moment. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for watching folks. We'll, uh, we'll do this again fairly soon, I hope. Bye now.